First Samuel, the 30th chapter. Amen. If you didn't get a paper, feel free to uh, raise your hand and we'll get one to you. And David recovered all that the Amalekites, 1 Samuel 30 and 18. And David recovered all the, that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered some. Oh, I misread that. All. David recovered all. I want to preach to you for a little while this morning. This subject is titled, Beyond the Battle is Sweet Victory. Beyond the Battle is Sweet Victory. Can we pray? Lord, you are wonderful. You're magnificent. Thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. Thank you for being there, a friend that's closer than a brother. Thank you for understanding us when we didn't understand ourselves. Today, I pray that your word ministers to us, challenges us, and changes us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. You may be seated. Beyond the battle, I think we all carry some battle scars. We have our stories to tell. We could talk about the things that have happened in the last 24 months, 18 months, 12 months, 6 months. We can talk about the things that have happened in our life and what brought us to where we are and how God has helped us to overcome. It was a man named John Wesley Powell. That's pretty well forgotten. He used to be that every grade school kid in America knew about Powell and knew about his amazing courage to survive the journey that was against all odds. As a matter of fact, a lot of people thought that Powell was really crazy. This expedition was simply too dangerous, especially for a man with just one arm. During the Civil War, Powell had lost his arm. There was an enemy soldier that shot him in the forearm, and that wound led to an amputation of Powell, and it was painful, and it was difficult, but he didn't let his injury stop him from being what he felt he was called to be. Back in 1869, conventional wisdom said that that passage through the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River was absolutely impossible. Nobody in the world could do that. And the country surrounded the Grand Canyon oozed with legends of doomed expeditions and those that over the years had tried to make their way through this impossible area. No one had ever really dared to uh, go into certain areas of that river and come out alive. Now, out of all of the expeditions that had given their very best shot, there was not one survivor. But one army lieutenant who had explored the Colorado just on the southern side of the Grand Canyon believed that that powerful Colorado River was so treacherous and that the greater part of its lonely and majestic way shall be forever unvisited and uninhabited. But the one-armed explorer thought, I can pull that thing off. May the 24th, 1869, Powell and a party of nine stepped into their boats to attempt this thousand-mile journey. Along the way, their party encountered numerous ambushes. They were ambushed by the Legion Killer Rapids. They were ambushed by the waterfalls. They were ambushed by the boulders the size of cabins. They were ambushed by... Uh, a, 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 a tremendous loss, the loss of their boats, critical foodstuffs, and the little instruments that they had. Yet 100 days later, Powell and five men emerged with two boats. The hope of their survival had been given up many years, many weeks before. And they were suffering from exposure. They were suffering from near starvation. But they made it. What happened to the other four that was supposed to be a part of them? 
One decided to turn back. The other three, after numerous disagreements, left the expedition. They hiked up the rim of the canyon only to be killed by the Indians. Powell and his men rose up again against the odd, and they pushed on through. Amen. There are some of you that if you could write your story or tell your story, many would not believe where you have been and how you got here today. Many would not understand. They could not fathom the road that you have traveled and the pain that you have endured but we stand here today by the grace of God we are from different countries <clears throat> from different nationalities from different states amen but we are one people in under the banner of Jesus Christ for he has brought us this far one writer said we have come this far by faith leaning on the Lord Leaning on him means walking with him daily. And our life and service to God is going to have more than one or two obstacles as we move forward. But it is those that have their roots deep in God that says nothing, no height, no depth, no principality, no power, no spiritual wickedness, no plan of the enemy is going to stop me on my walk with God, not going to stop my family. You're not going to make an obstacle. You're not going to come against me because God said, I will fight your battles for you. The more I live, the longer I live, coming to believe that there is something that burns in the heart of man that helps us to understand that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Oh, if you only understood today the power of God that rests inside of you. The church is beginning to understand our armaments. We're beginning to understand our armor. We're beginning to understand what God has given us. When he said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, that means if you will allow him, he will fight your battles for you. When you've done all you can do, he said, just stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Revival has the capacity to awaken within the heart of even the most distant saint of God. There is something that happens when you come into this house. Forsake not the assembling yourselves together, even as much more as we see the day approaching. Why? There is power in the house of God. There is strength in the house of God. There's encouragement in the house of God. There's deliverance in the house of God. There's salvation in the house of God. There's healing in the house of God where his presence is. 2 Corinthians 10 and 3 says, Although we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. Somebody say mighty. Mighty, mighty, mighty through God. Mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Oh, Satan had a plan, but his plan is failing. His plan won't stand. Satan has embezzled from the church individually and collectively. He has reached in every one of our families trying to destroy what God has promised us. He has plundered our joy. He has robbed too many of their victory. He has kidnapped one of our children or caught up in a place that they find themselves drifting toward the world. But there is power in the name of Jesus where two or three agree together on any one thing touching him. There is power in the name of Jesus. We have seen hell's worst. We've been a part of all that hell can throw at America and throw at our world but I stand to say that's for me and my house we're still serving the Lord he's tried to block our prayers tried to discourage us tried to bring depression 
tried to send every disease that he could possibly send, tried to block our worship, tried to lock us out of our place of worship. He's tried to loot our our peace, but there's always another side to the story. All of these things must be restored to the church whose hope is not in itself. It is not by might. It's not by power. But it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. The gates of hell shall not. You hear this preacher today. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. You are the church of the living God. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you fought this week. I'm not sure what is on the agenda next week. But I know this, that you are an overcomer. And you will be. And you shall I'll be and you have been a victor triumphant this church must arise and pursue why are we adding 150 more seats why are we bringing this thing up to date why are we staying on the edge because Jesus is coming and we have only a short time to work we don't have time for the, the, the silly things we don't have time for the trivial things but we have time to do and a short time to do his work church was never intended to be something that was stagnant cold indifferent divisive sitting on an island someplace, twiddling our thumbs. But we must be people that are meeting the challenge of the day. We have what we need. It is dynamic. This church is pulsating with life. You walk on this property, you drive in this parking lot, you can feel the power of prayer. You can sense the presence of God. You walk into that foyer, there are holy men and women of God. You sit in these pews around your holy men and women of God. You listen to the worshipers and the musicians, holy men and women of God. We are here for a divine purpose. We didn't come as Johnny come lately, but we came with our minds minds made up we are going to do the work that he sent us to do we find in the opening chapter of first samuel 29 that david was in a place called apec apec was a three-day journey from ziglag while david had been in apec the amalekites had been working destruction at the, same, at the only safe place that David had in his life. And if you remember, the Amalekites were those people whom had badgered and provoked the children of Israel practically every step of their journey when they left Egypt until the time they had settled in the promised land. But finally, God had enough. His instructions were clear to Saul, amen, and uh, to, to totally annihilate the Amalekites. But Saul, in the sad spiritual state that he was in, living in, refused to fulfill the entire purpose of God. He only obeyed half of what God instructed him to do. Partial obedience is equivalent to full disobedience. Partial obedience sometimes will soothe the count, our conscience, but it's not the will of God. I'm telling you today, it's not a time to be in the outer circle. It's not a time to be lukewarm. It's not a time to be just partially in the house, but we've got to be every part of us committed and in. And what Paul refused to deal with became an issue in the life of another a principle that we all must realize, I believe, in our life does, not, uh, does indeed affect those who are around us. Our decisions affect those that are around us. Everybody is looking at you and I. They're wanting to see if we are the real deal. So now because of the Amalekites who had not been dealt with by Saul, now began to heckle David and his men. And in his absence, they came and disputed uh, the lives of, 
of those that were in Ziklag and all of the wives of David and his men were taken and it was very discouraging. It was a terrible time for David. David had 600 men of those, of those 600, 200 were too weary to cross the brook. So David allowed them to stay behind while the others pursued. And every church will have among its saints those whose love for God burns high and their faith is real, but at times their strength seems to be weak and possibly they become discouraged. And there is something that I want to bring to you today, and that is God said, the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. He said, don't be weary and well-doing in due season. You will reap if you faint not. I come to bring the word of encouragement to you today that if you will continue to pursue God, God will restore you. They needed rest. Sometimes we just need rest. But a lot of factors may have been involved in their weariness. They had been in an alliance with the Philistines against Israel. They had been forced to march for three days back to Ziglag. Sometimes the pace that we're in, the pace that our world is in, it, we can become weary. And if we're not careful, we get our priorities out of sync. We begin to put everything before God, but we've got to keep our priorities straight today. And somebody said, amen. amen. They had to deal with the grief of the loss of Ziglag. Perhaps even the force of the swollen brook at Bezor was enough to dishearten them. But whatever the case may be, they were allowed to remain in a place of restoration and rest. And this same characteristic has to be found in this church. We have not always been at our best. We have to understand that among people, there are some of those that are still growing. There are, well, hopefully we're all growing, but I'm talking still infants in God. Some of those that are in different places, but we've got to understand that this may be their most violent storm. Maybe you're on top of the mountain, but maybe they're still climbing the mountain. We must be conscious of where our brothers and sisters are. We must wrap our arms around them and help them get through the turbulent and difficult times. I want it to be said that when I get to heaven, that it helped a lot of other people get there. Not self-righteous, not just me and my four, but I want to spread the love. I want to spread the encouragement. I want people to know that if you need me, I'll be here. How about you? Amen. So David and his 400 pressed on and engaged the Amalekites. First Samuel 30 and 17 gives us just a, a hint of the battle. David smote them from the twilight even into the evening of the next day. And sometimes the battle that we're in requires more than just a day. Sometimes the battle we're in lasts more than a week. Sometimes the season that we're in seems to be all battle. I want to give somebody hope today. It may be a year-long battle you've been in. It may have been three-year battle, but the sun is going to shine again. The joy is going to flow again. You've got to get to the top of that mountain. Just press, press. We press toward the mark of the high calling of God. The church is not built in the day. Oh, I remember... The first day we came here, I remember those difficult days. I remember wishing there was somebody that could play a piano. My wife could play just a little bit. I wanted just the Pentecostal service. I wanted somebody to say, "What? somebody said something over here just now. Oh, I wanted to hear somebody say amen. But those six people or eight people or ten people, they, 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 didn't, they didn't have it. They didn't really know much about Jesus. But I'm going to tell you, through the tough times, through the difficult times, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed of begging for bread. I thank God that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the same God that brought me through and the same God that brought you through is going to bring you through and you through and you through. Oh, clap your hands if you believe that. I 
prayer warrior is not building in a day. An intercessor is not building in a day. A soul winner is not built in a day. A great saint of God is not made in a day. But it's all of the things. It's that big old oak that we look up and say, Oh man, what a tree, what a tree. But you, what you didn't see is that little tiny seed as it began to be nurtured. And as that thing began to grow some roots and things began to happen underground. Do you know that many times that foundation is being built in our life and we see somebody else that's soaring, but there are some trees that can soar overnight in just a few months and outgrow everything around them we must be involved it's not a day to get on the island by yourself we can't excuse our personalities we can't excuse that that I am not a personal or a personable person or I'm this or I'm that we must be involved because we are touching people's lives every day we cannot be on an island by ourselves. amen if Satan can, he'll get your, your mind going in different directions. We are as Esau cannot recover some, the birthright, the challenge, sold something that you can't buy back. We live in a lot of, I wish I could have, I wish I had of, I wish I could undo, I wish I could redo. But maybe we are as Judas and we betrayed some that would say, I, I, I betrayed. I'll never be able to redeem who I was supposed to be. I left who I was supposed to be many years ago. Or like the rich young ruler who had bypassed the intersection of opportunity and we can't seem to make a U-turn. I want to help somebody that's stuck. The ment your mentality is, I've passed up my best days. I've passed up my opportunities. I've blown my past I can never recover I can never be what God wants me to be amen the enemy would want you he's the one that hates you he's the one that's out to destroy you he wants you to think that you cannot retrace your steps you cannot recover but there is a word that tells me I will restore saith the Lord the years that the locust the canker worm, the palmer worm, it goes on to say, and my people will never be ashamed. I preach to you today that there's a spirit of restoration in this house. There's a spirit of restoration. If I could tell the stories of people that nobody knew, but maybe pastors here knew of how God is restored from the very clutches of hell, lives that were totally wrecked, but I've lived long enough to see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that God restored. Micah 7 and 8, rejoice not, a, not over me, O oh, mine enemies. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be light unto me. Don't go home until that pleasantly plump lady sings her song. Don't give up, amen, when you see me down because I'm coming back up. You may have seen the worst, but you're about to see the best. You've seen me in my weary storm, somebody saying, but I'm coming through this thing. I'm going to be, I'm going to recover. I may have lost my home, but I'm going to be buying two homes. I may have seemed to have lost a family member, but God has given me somebody else in my life. Amen. If you know somebody that's fallen or if you have fallen, be a part of helping them get back up. Ziglag has looted and destroyed, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. How many knows that depression won't get you anywhere? Fear won't get you anywhere. Anything that will pull you down, discouragement won't get you. But if somehow you can get into the house of God, if you can get into the presence of God, I feel chains breaking even as I'm preaching right now. I feel depression being driven off of people. I feel hopelessness being driven off. Not he only here, but I hear it online as well. The fire was rekindled. 
David recovered in a day what he had lost over a period of months, maybe even years. Amen. He fought against the odds. What are you saying, Pastor? Get back up again. Don't you believe the lie of the enemy? The peace of God that passes all understanding will come to you. You'll be able to sleep again. You'll begin to dream again. Oh, I hear it. I feel it. Amen. Difficulties are suddenly left in the dust. Tears of defeat suddenly turn to songs of victory. Trouble turns. Amen. And there is something that seems to be transforming even in this house today. Faith. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I feel faith in the house. I feel faith driving out fear. I feel the presence of God refreshing your soul even now. Tears of defeat suddenly turn to these songs of victory. Trouble suddenly turns into a, a spiritual gem that hardens the muscles and begins to build the strength. I'm not a pushover anymore, devil, because I've been praying. There's something about physical exercise that, that kind of builds your strength, and you feel I'm not just a weakling anymore. That's what's been happening around here. These prayer meetings, these powerful services, our prayer rooms being filled with people that are praying. Our spiritual strength is strong in the Lord apostolic quest purpose and passion may have been robbed from us in seasons but we must recover those things which have been lost we've got to recover them we can't just become a number we can't just become somebody drifting through life but we've got to get up with purpose when your foot hit the the floor this morning i hope hell went on red alert oh no not brother jones is out of bed not brother smith is out of bed not sister so-and-so is out of bed but i hope the alarms of hell went off when you got out of bed this morning oh no they have power they can bind us they can curse us they can send us back to hell where we came from if we understood who we are we can take dominion over that demon spirit that's destroying our family David refused to lift a hand against Saul but he went after that molesting force of the Amalekites he destroyed them amen there are things that we cannot change there are some people that we would like to change, but we can't change them. But we must preach this, that God is a God of mercy and that God will help you. And even though you've made mistakes, some of us just didn't get caught. We're not in prison because we didn't get caught smoking this or, or using that or doing that or something else. This church must be a church of mercy. We look at people with mercy. We love them no matter who they are. We care about them. We must tell them that God is a rebuilder. God is a restorer. God can heal that marriage. God can heal your body. God can, God can heal your mind. The epistle of Peter reveals to us his descent toward recover. The man of Gadara, void of clothing, void of mind, void of morals. The devil had completely destroyed him. There's a lot of places we haven't reached with compassion. Brother Chris, I'm glad to hear, raise your hand. I'm glad to hear that we have an opening in the prisons. I'm glad that you were just certified. There are people that we're going to reach that we haven't been reaching, but we're going to reach to him. God is a restorer. The epistle, the epistle of Peter reveals to us his descent toward recovery. The devil had worked to destroy everything. He comes to what? Kill, steal, and destroy. Amen. Roots are important. Destroy the root system of a tree. The tree finally dies. Many times we're looking at symptoms, not roots. But the root is what we're talking about today. The root of evil. People act this way. They do this. They do that. They do something else. That's not the root. Many times their only God they've got is the bottle that they drink. 
or they shoot up to try to survive another day and overcome the pain that they have and the trauma that's been in their life. This church must be a people of compassion looking past the symptom and seeing the root. Amen. Amen. The woman at the well, bad reputation, plagued, pirated, Wasted by illicit relationships. Five husbands. The one that she was with was not her, her own husband. But all of her life had been sucked out of her. She was like a piece of gum that all the sweetness had been chewed out of it and then spat on the dirt. Nothing left. Nothing left. That's until one who loved her stepped on the scene. One that saw not her fault but saw her need. One that seen not the disgusting life that she had lived, but his love reached beyond all of that stuff and said, if you'll come to me, I'll give you life. I'll give you water. I'll give you hope. I'll restore you. I'll give you back what you never seemed to have possessed. Wretched, tainted, questionable. All the details forced her to go to the well in the middle of the day because of the shame. Amen. But when Jesus got through, her morality, her chastity, her purity was restored to her. I don't know what you need restored to you. I don't know all that you've been through, but I'm preaching the word of God to you today that Jesus has walked into this building and he said, I'm going to restore you. Lift your hands. He said, I will help you when you can't help yourself. I don't know all the bad that has happened to you, but I know that God keeps perfect records. And he said, judgment is mine. Vengeance is mine. I will take care of that adversary. I'll take care of that person. I'll take care of those things. But you lean on me and allow me to be God. And I will take charge of this. Oh, my, feel his presence. Don't stop praising him. Put your hands together and magnify him. What God determines, God gets. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Abraham received from the grave. Jacob released from the grave. The Hebrews in the furnace, fiery furnace, Oh, everybody might be bowing. And we say, is anybody going to be saved? Yes, sir, there will always be a remnant. And he said, and greater things shall you do. In the latter days, I'm going to pour out my spirit. This is the day of revival. The greater it's dark, the greater mercy runs. And the spirit of God is calling. The Lord always shows up with the keys. Would you bring it home, Pastor? I will. He's got the keys to your house. He's got the keys to your problem. He can unlock what has been locked for a lifetime. He can unlock that gifting that you know is there and someone has hinted that it was there. God can unlock that. Amen. There is the gifts of the Spirit that are flowing. I believe today God is helping you to understand that you have not gone too far. Job lost all. All. But the Word declares... That despite all that he lost, he fell down and worshiped. Naked I came into this world, naked I will return. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Would you stand with me and lift your hands? Say with me, naked I came into this world, and naked I may return. But I am determined to bless the Lord at all times. Would you lift your voice to him and magnify him even now? Amen. 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 The boils appeared as the music comes. The body is covered. The pain is intense. He needs help. He needs encouragement. He is in trouble. Everything that could go wrong to a human being seemed that it did go wrong. The boils appear. The three friends 
come. Watch for seven days in silence. And then the ever encroaching question, where is God? Where is God in your pain? Where is God in all the bad that's happened to you, Job? Thought you were a Christian. Thought you said God was with you. Thought you said that God would do this and God would do that. Look at you, man. You've lost everything. Your family, you've lost all of your wealth. Here you are in boils and pain. And the accusers came. The issue was God knew where he was. Sometimes we don't understand where, where God is. You could share this story. I could share this story many times. I prayed, walked to those woods that I've walked for 20 years plus. Oh, God, where are you? Where are you? I need you. Sometimes he allows us, it seems, to walk alone. Heaven seems to be silent. But in that process, he's growing a root system. Faith is building. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. In my flesh, I will see God. We're here only for a season. Don't get too caught up in this season. Don't buy too much into wealth. Don't buy too much into everything else. Amen. When purpose, passion, vision are gone, there's still a God that can restore all. He can and he will. Amen. The 93 leading biographies of the men who have most impacted America did not come into their own until age 57 years old. Those that have most powerfully impacted America, the biographies of men who have most impacted America didn't happen until they were 57 years old. It is time for us to pursue, to overtake, to overcome. It's time for us to get back our worship in a minute, I'm going to call for you to come to this altar. In any area that you need, he's here to minister. It's time for us to get back to our faithfulness, take charge of our life, not letting life take charge of us. Our commitment, our confidence, get back our family, our finances, our sense of holiness, our devotion of prayer, Rearranging our priorities, our joy, our hunger for the things of God, our hunger for the word of the Lord, our desire to reach the lost. Time to recover, pursue, overtake. Moses made it to 120 years. His eyes did not dim, according to the scripture. The latter house I mentioned shall be greater than the former. Amen. Our church, the church of God. Shall, shall move forward. We shall be greater and do more for humanity, do more for people than we've ever done before.